Um, good evening, everyone. As rightfully said, my name is Dr. Nyara Tomoy. In practice, um, it's my pleasure to do this presentation and discussion with you this evening. So I'm going to be presenting on minimum trauma extractions, um, which is a way of review some um, relatively newer extraction instruments which uh, assist with achieving a minimal trauma extraction. So the definition of a minimal trauma extraction is uh, the removal of a tooth or the removal of a tooth root while you are maintaining a harmonious relation with gingiva, bone, and other surrounding hard and soft tissue structures. So preservation of the alveolar ridge really begins at the extraction level by... So here is a picture of what we would ideally want to achieve when we do an extraction. This is an extraction of an upper six. And as you can see, the buccal and palatal walls are intact. The septal bone is intact. Yeah, so ideally, this is what we would want to achieve. Much easier. And It, in terms of the level of the soft tissue, the bone level, um, even the morbidity on the patient would be improved. Okay, so um, I'm going to just clarify what we mean by improved outcomes in implantology with um, minimal trauma extractions. So we are talking about implant success, which according to uh, basically to consider the health of the implant, so implant success would be where there is absence of um, tenderness, where there's no mobility, mobility of the implant, where there are no exudates, and where the radiographic bone loss after surgery does not exceed two millimeters. However, in addition to this implant um, of the implant, the stability, of the peri-implant tissues and also the restorative uh, functionally with the opposing dentition. Um, so we just want to review quickly um, conventional tooth extractions. Conventional tooth extractions normally involve uh, some sort of buccolingual rotation of two. Or fracture of the buccal plate, as you can see here, which is actually very important for keeping the peri-implant soft tissues at the correct level and for the aesthetics of the patient. So this is the conventional tooth extraction. Just uh, please keep that in mind. From there, we just want also to review the effects of tooth loss. So when a tooth of, is lost, we, we're going to lose bone height and we're also going to lose bone width. Uh, the resorption is greatest on the buccal aspect, which is about 50%. 
partly because yeah so the resorption is going to be greatest on the buccal aspect partly because um most of the buccal bone is um, made up of bundle bone as you know the bundle bone is where the peri the periodontal ligament collagen fibers insert and it's part and parcel of the structure of the tooth and the periodontia. So when you lose the, the tooth, you're also going to lose that bundle bone, which makes the majority of the crystal part of the buccal bone. You're also going to have a uh, loss of vertical bone of about two to four millimeters. And most of this um, ridge resorption will happen within So of a ridge resorption you can expect will, will depend on the periodontal phenotype that you have. So um, I think you remember we have three phenotypes. We have the that thin, uh, the medium and the thick phenotype. With the thin phenotype, your probe is going to show through here is your probe and with the thick you won't see the probe through through the sulcus so when you have also correlate to the to the thickness of the labial plates uh, it will also correlate with the alveolar crease position it will also correlate with the width of keratinized tissue it will correlate with the gingival architecture and it will also labial bone of a thickness beyond one millimeter. Uh, the majority, the labial plate is going to be quite uh, thin. minimal trauma extraction. We are trying to maintain that bone volume and bone quantity. And we are trying to maintain also the bone, the bone quality. We're trying to preserve the gingival architecture. We are trying to maintain the vitality of the periodontal ligament. We are trying to maintain the blood supply at the implant sites. As you can imagine, if you raise a flap, possibly if you have releasing incisions, that's going to um, interrupt the blood supply to the implant site. And we're also trying to minimize damage to the adjacent structures. Practically, what does this mean for us in the clinic? Um, if we are able to, to do all this, it means that we are possibly more likely able to do an, imme an immediate implant placement or a type one, also called a type one um, implant placement. It's going to also reduce the clinical treatment time for the patient. As you can imagine, they will heal faster and, and everything. Um, it's going to also uh, make it easier to have the correct implant positioning and aesthetics. Um, if there is still need for bone in, you are probably going to need um, less advanced uh, uh, procedures to, to augment that bone, uh, simpler bone uh, material and, and all that. So, um, to the flesh of the discussion, the prince is the prince. Your routine extractions using traditional instruments, less traumatic, and definitely these um, 
are useful when you're using the, the newer um, extraction instruments. So the principle number one, I'm just gonna go through all of them. And then in the coming slides, I will be explaining at least the top four because those are the major ones. Um, so principle number one for minimal trauma extractions is you must section your tooth. This is um, obviously um, relates to multi-rooted teeth. Uh, principle number two is you must severe the connective tissue fibers. Principle number three is you must minimize soft tissue reflection or employ a flapless approach, not flawless. Uh, principle number four is you must reduce the contact areas, the contact areas of the tooth that you are removing. Uh, you must not use excessive force. We've already talked about not using bacolingual movements with your dental forceps, but only using back and forth uh, movements. Um, um, obviously this is only possible when already the tooth is quite mobile. Then you can also do circumferential troughing. This is usually where you have um, retained roots that are really firm um, and really strong in the bone. You can above your bone is going to provide uh, carbide bay, which um, different, different blades arrangement. Yeah, so that's about it with the tooth sectioning. After you section your tooth, you can remove each root individually. Your chances of succeeding with doing that without actually, you know, doing your buckling work um rotations is actually higher so the next the next principle to keep in mind to achieve your minimally traumatic extraction is to sever the connective tissue fibers and incise the sharpest fibers in all other connective tissue fibers circumferentially or around the tooth. So here to do that, you want to use your periotome because it's very thin and very sharp uh, or a number 15 C blade. This number 15 C blade is, is generally got, um, it's got um, a longer blade than longer and thinner so you can actually reach much further than, than other blades like the 15, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so the picture there shows uh, a periotome and like this is like new periotomes which are actually flexible and are able to follow the, the curvature of the root of the tooth and therefore they are able to actually go much deeper. Just a moment. Just having some water. Um, so the third principle would be to minimize soft tissue reflection because you don't want to disrupt your blood supply to the, to the bone. So the cortical bone receives more than 80% of its blood supply through the periosteum. So if you're going to raise your full thickness uh, mucoperiosteal flap, the fact that you have raised that periosteum from the cortical bone means that you have actually cut off that 80% uh, blood supply to the cortical bone, you're only left with 20% going to that cortical bone. So you can imagine the healing capacity of that cortical bone or its life is quite compromised. Uh, the venous return of that cortical bone as well is mainly through the periosteum. So here we are really trying to leave the 
periosteum untouched. Um, to avoid issues like soft tissue retraction and possibly, you know, showing the threads of the implant or whatever. Uh, we are also trying to avoid shrinkage during healing, especially in the anterior region. We are also trying to preserve shrinkage in the interdental papillary region. But where you need to, to raise a flap, it's better to, to raise an envelope flap as this leaves your blood supply at least not cut by the releasing incisions. Um, so just um, a recall of the three that I've mentioned so far, uh, the principles, um, tooth sectioning um, is going to help. Um, cutting, incising the connective tissue fibers is going to help. Minimizing the soft tissue reflection is definitely going to help. So reducing the contact areas, this helps because um, it makes the tooth much easier to just, you know, for lack of a better word, pull out without uh, impediment from the adjacent tooth. So you, you want to establish a straight path of extraction for the tooth. It's easier for instrumentation. You are preserving the enamel of the adjacent teeth as well as any restorations that might be on the adjacent teeth. So these are the four major principles to just keep in mind if you are um, removing a tooth, whether the usual way with our forceps and elevators. So next we are just going to summarize quickly um, the newer techniques that are available for minimal trauma extraction. So at first I'll, I'll just list them all. So we have mechanical techniques and we have motorized techniques and we have other advanced um, techniques. Um, some of these advanced techniques, these are mainly used by specialists. Um, so the most popular on the mechanical, mechanical techniques is a periotome, which I feel like everybody really should have, as it's very simple to use, very cheap to buy as well. And yet possibly the one that's most applicable with most teeth, like that's normally enough for most teeth. We have a proximator as well, which is generally just a larger version of a periotome. We have a physics forceps. I'm just going to talk about this, about each one of these individually in summary. Um, we also have um, devices that are based on um, anchor and pulley techniques, such as the organics okay. extractor. system. Mm. Um, minimal trauma extractions by extruding the teeth. And we have um, the root preservation techniques. These are, these were developed in South Africa. And we have the rubber band extraction, quite fascinating, but not very popular. Then on the motorized one, we have the powered periotome. It's just a periotome, which is powered. <laughs> and we have the piezo surgery, the sono surgery. I think this, the specialists probably use that um, much more yeah, than the general dentist, if any at all use it. Then uh, we have the removal of root, fragments using implant drills at the time of implant site preparation. And then we have the ears. The ears is basically an endoscopy method. So the E there is for endoscopy. You are generally using your endoscopy to get better um, vision of your operating area. And then we have laser. So I hope this is not too long. I will be summarizing this pretty quite a lot, so I should go through it pretty fast. 
So the periotomes, they come in different shapes to allow access to different parts of the tooth. Mm, it's a thin blade like instrument used to incise the periodontal ligament. Uh, it should not be rotated or used to elevate a tooth as it can easily fracture and you can easily just spend the good part of your day trying to retrieve the teeth. Uh, it can also be used with um, mallet for deeper penetration. Mm. How you use it is you um, advance it into the periodontal ligament space and you leave it for 10 to 20 seconds. This is to allow for creep. So creep is basically when something changes shape after after being stressed for a long time, like if you put a ball in uh, on top of a pile of clay, that pile of clay is gonna be right. So you want to, so you, so you want your, your bone to give way because of the periotom. So to give the bone, you have to give it about 10 to 20 seconds for the bone to give way. Uh, you don't want to use your periotom facially because again, is there anything more precious than the buccal bone? So uh, you are going to use it on all other surfaces except buccally. So that's the periotom um, pictured over there. Um, I skipped the proximator. The proximator is just a uh, a bigger period form, so to speak. Um, was the okay, so we are moving next to the physics fossa. So just to give um, most of these most of my descriptions on these techniques uh, will be alluding to everyday things. I think that just makes things more interesting. Uh, so um, the first picture over here, it shows our traditional forceps, which works like a pliers to remove a tooth. You hold your tooth like that and you shake it. The physics forceps works like a claw hammer. This picture to the to the right. So how a physics forceps will have an advantage over the, the traditional forceps is that it's, it's gonna give um, more steady, uh, it's not gonna give intermittent forces to the tooth. When you're using a physics forceps, your, your forces are likely to be more continuous. Um, so when your forces are more continuous, you have a higher release of uh, the enzyme, hyaluronidase, which is basically responsible for the biochemistry of tooth extraction. Hyaluronidase is the one which is going to affect um, the hyaluronic acid, which is important uh, as an attachment biochemical in that tooth. You're also going to have a, 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 a bigger buildup of creep with the, with, the, with the physics forcep. So the physics forcep, like the ordinary forceps that we have, it also comes in many different styles for each tooth, for lack of a better word. So each tooth has got its own physics forceps. The, the blue things there are the bumper, which are to protect for protecting the gum, because um, the so this one has a beak. On the other hand, our ordinary forcep has two beaks. This one will have a beak and a bumper on the other hand, and um, these blue things are for protecting the 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 soft tissue from that bumper. So that's the physics forcep. Um, this one was developed by Golden Dent. Yeah, so next up, we have the, 
the pulley-based extraction devices. So these ones have the anchor screw. The anchor screw goes into the tooth. Then you have a traction cable, which will pull out on the anchor screw as you turn a hand screw at the end there. So you just drill a channel in the tooth, put your anchor screw, and as you turn the hand screw, the traction cable will pull out the tooth. Um, some disadvantages and advantages of that. Yeah, one disadvantage is if you're going to use it on multi-rooted teeth, you have to you have to put it on each root. It's not going to be able to take up all the roots. So this obviously will mean that you're spending a lot more time um, removing that tooth. But bear in mind, uh, it may look like you are spending a lot more time, but you are actually saving. You, you might actually be saving yourself time. The time that you're going to use to to do your bone augmentation and bone grafting and all that. So, which makes it quite worthwhile. So that's your pulley devices. Next up, we have our liver de devices. Um, yeah, so a good example is the easy extract system. So this one is you, as you turn the hand knob, you are lifting up the screw through a lever. Mm, if you go on YouTube, these things actually look very, uh, that means I haven't used them, but, <laughs> but they actually look really, really effective and quite interesting. Um, I think it would be good to try someday. Um, advantages of the, of the liver systems, The advantage is, is that unlike the, um, the pulley system, this one is going to have, have longer screws. It has wider screws. So even where you're, for some reason, due to pathology, your root canal system was enlarged and everything, maybe you've removed a post or whatever. Uh, the easy extract system is likely going to be able to engage that uh, root canal, whereas the, the Benex extractor system has much smaller um, anchorage screws. So going on to the ex orthodontic extrusion technique, um, as you can see in the pictures, the very good indications for this is when someone has um, significant soft tissue and bone defects because as you orthodontically extrude the tooth, the, the bone and the soft tissue is going to follow, um, to follow and, and you are repairing that defect already. Mm. So the indications would be patients with significant soft tissue and bone defects or patients who are already in need of orthodontic therapy the disadvantage is that it takes a long time to do. It's expensive, also it's generally expensive. The person might need to walk around with um, brackets and what, what, which can be quite um, an aesthetic. Another thing to remember also is that after you have finished your treatment, you also have to, to leave everything on there before you actually extract your tooth so that the bone might mature. Um, and also, as you can see on the fourth picture, this tooth was actually extruded to a point where the gingiva was actually much more cervical than that of the neighbor, because a bit of it actually will recede back. You also actually experience a bit of bone loss. So you want to, you want to do your orthodontic extrusion, including the the amount of tissue that you are you are going to likely lose after the extraction if that makes any sense i hope it makes sense 
So the root preservation techniques or the partial extraction therapies. So with the root preservation or the partial extraction therapies, these are basically are based off on the on the fact that your bundle bone, your 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 buccal bone, especially on anterior teeth, the crestal part of your buccal bone is mainly bundle bone, and bundle bone is an integral part of the tooth and periodontal ligament. So you remove the tooth and periodontal ligament, and even if you do an immediate implant placement, you are still going to lose that bone. But if you preserve the root, it means the uh, periodontal ligament is still there and that buccal bundle bone is still there. So there are basically three um, root preservation techniques or partial extraction therapies. Um, the first one in the diagram there is a pontic shield. So this is where you leave um, a bit of the buccal part of the root in the sockets. Doing this. So this is not for when you are going to put an implant. Um, but anyway, it's going to probably um, enable you to have a really nice emergence profile and everything because your bone will be preserved. So that's the first one. You have a pontic shield. You have uh, a bit of your buccal, um, the, a bit of your buccal root left in the pontic space. Uh, the socket shield is more like the pontic shield, but no, no, before I talk about the, okay, fine. The socket shield. The socket shield is more like the pontic shield, but here you are actually going to place an implant in that place with the with the buccal part of your of um and any bond loss there. Bond loss is actually the one. Keeps, uh, you, you are trying to keep the anatomy of the reach as is. So um, they are, I think I, 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 I did write on the references, the papers that describe um, how to do this. It's very successful. So between the submerged root technique and the pontic shield. Remember, these two are both used for your pontic regions. The difference is that you are going to use your pontic shield technique when there is periapical pathology on the tooth. Okay, so next up is the rubber band extraction. Mm, like I said, this might not be very popular but it's generally um, indicated where the tooth has a nice conical anatomy uh, because you, you put a rubber band under tension on the tooth and because it's under tension, the rubber band is going to force itself down to a thinner part of the root. Now, if the root is not nicely chronically getting smaller, that rubber band is going to get wedged somewhere as is here. And you are not going to have um, success with that. Um, so I think that's all about the mechanical ways. On the, the motorized techniques, you have the the powered periodon, yeah. So it can come as either a standalone machine or a or a handpiece that you put uh, on your slow speed with the tips and everything, and it just basically does the same thing that the the hand periodon will do. 
you you want to to begin using this at a low speed as higher speeds will cause more vibration and make the patient uncomfortable yeah so more vibration more noise and make the patient uncomfortable uh, generally, I don't think you go around, you go beyond 4,000 rotations per minute. Uh, Piers of surgery and sonosurgery. surgery, I'll just talk about these at once. I think these are basically used by specialists. Okay. Um, they, the Piers of surgery mainly will cut mineralized tissue. So it's not going to cut your soft tissue. So um, I think uh, most people are going to use this when they are doing wisdom tooth extractions because then you, your alveolar nerve is um, protected. They produce a lot of heat, so you want to irrigate. Hence, that saline they hanging over there. It's better if it's refrigerated. Um, they are more. They they cut bone more easily, so they are better used by people who have good control of their use. The then going to the sono surgery units. Mm. It produces much less heat. It's it basically looks the same as this one. Uh, sometimes it's just a change of tips or hand pieces and hand pieces. Um, Whatever, but um, so this one is going to produce much less heat, and uh, it also enables working to close to soft tissue. You have to be careful about aerosols in patients who have um, infectious diseases. Okay. I think I've already spoken about that. Yeah, so using implant drills, uh, this is normally done when people want to do immediate implant placements. Uh, the article which explains that is written there, but you want your, your implant drill to basically be putting pressure palatally and you are just thinning the root until it's easy for you to remove. Then you take an X-ray to just verify that there isn't any root uh, material left in that socket. Then with the ears, yeah, like I said, this is endoscopy. It, it basically just gives better vision I don't think these are used by many people, but for those of you guys who like art, I think you can see from this art picture that um, things seem to be falling inwards. So basically with this one, uh, you're going to make your, your root canal much thicker and you're going to split the root and then everything implodes inwards. So it's an implosion technique. You use your gate lead and base to split the root and you mobilize them in the center. Um, mm, I don't know if it's used by many people anyway, but it allows more precise bone removal which means that less bone is removed. It's non-contact, so there's not gonna be any bone flower. And with the newer techniques, there is less uh, thermal damage or bone neck process. So thank you guys for your attention. Uh, I will take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moyo. Colleagues, are there any questions? For um, Dr. Moyo, that was um, a wonderful presentation. And uh, I've learned a new ways. I didn't know that there are many ways of extracting teeth uh, like these ones. But it was really good. Any questions, colleagues? You can show by raising your hand.
or you can type your question in the chat box. It looks like you were very clear, Dr. Moyo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for no. not asking questions, guys. <laughs> okay, so that brings, that brings me to, my, to the end of my presentation. All right. Thank you very much. So oh, this next yes. uh, uh, presentation, the, colleagues, the, thank you yes. very much for What are the important accountable? You know, that's when, at least at this stage, Thank I was survival. So, yeah, the references, um, because I, I was going pretty fast with these things. I was summarizing everything. These are the references um, for, for all those things. And for some of them, YouTube is really good. And most of the things I've talked about, particularly the things I talked about at the top, they, they I think those can are, are very good to use as well. The lasers and the what, what those are just for completion in the endoscopy and yeah. So the Dr. Haman I think. It looks like Dr. Hamandich has dropped off. Uh, just a comment, Doc. Thank you very much. I found I'm not really that strong on that uh, area. So I found uh, I was able to follow quite a lot of the explanations. So thanks for the patient uh, explanations. Is there anyone who still has any comment or question uh, before we can uh, close it up? Okay, if none, yeah, I don't, I don't see any more questions. Tawanda, are there any more questions? No, no, no questions. Okay, once again, thank you uh, and colleagues uh, have a good evening. I think we can end the meeting, Tawanda.